is a video for 20.3 Radio Pharmaceuticals in the Medical Physics Techniques Unit in VTEC Applied Science. What we're looking at here is radio pharmaceuticals. So by that we mean radioactive isotopes which are used in medicine and the way that we're looking at it here is how they are used as a tracer inside the body. So you either inject or the patient ingests a radioactive isotope and uh, as it moves through the body, the radiation that it's emitting provides a way that we can trace its location in the body. Quite often what the doctors are looking for is a place where the, the tracer accumulates, so you get a strong signal from that area indicating that there's some inflammation or some kind of blockage, something going on in the body there. Okay, so this assignment has two pass criteria, P3 and P4, and that's what I'm going to cover in this video. Uh, P3, let's start off with that. We have to describe how the radio pharmaceuticals are produced and how they are detected. Just in general principles for this. Um, and then P4, I'll look at afterwards. So P3, <coughs> and what we're going to have to do here is, we, well, we're going to look at two radio isotopes here. We're going to look at technetium 99M, and then it's ID131. Those are two radio pharmaceuticals. We're going to look at how they're produced and then how you detect them in general principles. P4 goes into more detail about it. So, uh, technician 99M and ID131. The one thing, the key thing about those two radio pharmaceuticals that they have in common is they both emit gamma radiation. And gamma radiation is what you want to use for, uh, for your tracer. Okay, gamma radiation, that's the key thing. Why do we want gamma radiation? Well, if you remember back to 20.1, when we were looking at three types, well, in general principles, three types of radiation, you have alpha, beta, and gamma. Gamma is the one that is most penetrating. And so what that means in this context is that it's most likely to escape the body. Once you put it inside the body, it can travel through the body quite easily. Some of it will obviously be absorbed by the body, but most of it will escape the body, providing a way for you to detect it if you have your detector outside the body, uh, which it's going to be. So gamma radiation, that's the key thing for tracers. Both uh, technetium 99 m and ID131, they both emit gamma radi radiation. However, ID131 also emits beta radiation when it decays. So this is just pure gamma. This one is gamma plus beta. <coughs> now, we're not going to look at the implications of that in the past criteria, but you will, if you go on to the merit, be looking at what this may mean uh, for the patient and, uh, well, whether that's an advantage or disadvantage. So I'll not talk about that right now, but th this is the key one here, they both gamma. Now both of these we actually get from another radioactive decay. So we're going to identify the isotope that is used to prepare each of these and write the decay equation for it. So let's start with technetium 99M. That comes from an element called molybdenum. Now, the details for that, the atomic and the mass numbers, they can be found in the brief for 20.1. So look that up. If you've lost your brief, then you can get that on Moodle. Get that, and uh, you can identify the numbers for it then, and it decays by beta minus into TC99M. Okay, so you can probably work out what the numbers are there for that. But it's a beta minus. So we have our beta minus particle, which is an electron, if you remember, and an anti-neutrino, anti-electron neutrino. I haven't written in the numbers there. That's what you all have to do for your decay equation. <coughs> and uh, where does molybdenum come from? Comes, uh, comes from nuclear power stations. So nuclear power stations, they collect the molybdenum 
and they provide that to hospitals and they'll produce a generator with that so that uh, the, the staff who work with radiopharmaceuticals prepare them, they can use that generator to get the, the technician from it. That's technician and now iodine 131, going to do a similar thing and tellurium is used to produce the iodine, tellurium 131. And this decays by beta minus as well, so you can have a similar thing going on with the numbers. Okay, but you work out the numbers for those. Uh, so that's our decay equations that we need to do. That is everything required for the production of radio pharmaceuticals in P3. For the, the detection, what you need to do is think about how you have your patient and it has a radio pharm they have the radio pharmaceutical inside their body okay, so it's the patient's body uh, so let's say there's an accumulation of the radio pharmaceutical here it's emitting gamma radiation that gamma radiation is emitted in all directions so it doesn't just travel towards your detector it doesn't know there's a detector there to travel towards. It's just travelling in all directions. Okay, so this is gamma radiation. And uh, now that's the patient radio pharmaceutical inside them. Outside the patient is your detector at some point, perhaps above them. But the key thing is here, it's outside the body. And that will detect the radiation that travels through the body to the detector. Okay, so there's radiation going in all directions, but whatever's going towards the detector will get detected. <coughs> Some of the radiation, of course, as I said earlier, will get absorbed inside the body. So this doesn't make it to the detector, but most of the gamma, because it's gamma radiation, most of it will exit the body. Some of this as well, the radiation travelling downwards in this case, would also get absorbed, but most of it would travel outside. So that's in general principles what you need what you need to appreciate here. But the radiation needs to travel through the body in order to reach the detector, which is outside the body. And that is P3. So very short, very sweet. P4, let's move on to this because what we're going to do is build on what we've just been looking at here to explain how the Radio pharmaceuticals are used within the operating principles of the gamma camera. So we're going to look at this detector in more detail. The detector, the gamma camera, that is made up of four main components. You have a collimator. Scintillator, photomultiplier tube, and then lastly the electronics or computer. You can kind of call it whichever you prefer. So those are the four main components, and what you have to do is explain how each of those work. In order to do that, you also need to draw a diagram with each of those four components at, annotated on it in the correct order. So you need to have each of those in the correct order with the patient as well to show <coughs> in your diagram. Patient, and then the gamma camera. four components clearly shown in your diagram, okay? Okay, so that, that's your diagram, and then you need to do a little bit of explanation, so explain how this works. The idea here with the collimator 
is that you can see from this diagram the radiation is travelling in all directions and if you were to zoom in on part of, uh, part of it, what's going on here, this is your detector here. And if the radiation is going in all directions, because it's not being emitted from a point, you know, you can get some radiation going, crossing over like this, okay? So if you have, whenever you make a detection at this location here, then what you, the way you interpret that is radiation came from directly below, and so the radiation is at this location inside the patient. However, if the radiation travelled at an angle to get there, like that, then that's a false interpretation of what's happening. The radiation didn't travel like that, it travelled over here, so actually it's over here. What we need to do is eliminate these these radiation beams which are not perpendicular to our detector. So what we do is if we put in something here, these walls, okay, these are like these are walls which will absorb the radiation. Okay? So now this radiation beam traveling at an angle will hit the wall here, okay? And that means that the radiation can then not travel to the, that location, to the detector. It gets stopped before the detector. This does mean that the quality of our image in terms of the amount of radiation we're receiving is reduced because we're gonna receive less radiation. Some of it's gonna be absorbed by this stage here, the collimator. Um, however, our spatial resolution, so that the information we're getting from the patient, now we can identify where the radiation is coming from. In order to get to this point here on the detector, we know the radiation can only get there if it travelled straight up. Okay, and the same thing here, we know it had to travel straight up. If this one, if this radiation beam coming in from over here was going to strike the detector, it would now be absorbed by the wall here. So therefore, we've now eliminated those stray beams. The radiation can only pass through if it's parallel to the walls of the collimator. So you'll have to discuss how this is working and in particular, note the material used here. The material used for the collimator and why we use that material. So why is it used? Think about this is gamma radiation. What, do you, what type of material do you need in order to make sure the gamma radiation is absorbed by those walls? All right, so that's the collimator. That's stage one done. The scintillator. The scintillator is the first stage of the detector, actually, this stage here. Okay? Uh, scintillation is when is a process by which, uh, when an ionising radiation reaches a material which can scintillate, when it reaches it, you get a little flash of light. Okay? So you get like a conversion from radiation. Now this will work with either X radiation or gamma radiation, both will cause scintillating materials to scintillate. Uh, in our context we're using gamma because x-rays have to be produced by a large machine, if you remember from the last assignment. So you can't put a large machine inside the patient in order to use it as a tracer. So it's radiation is turned into flashes of light. So scintillating materials are often crystal, some type of crystal. Uh, one type of such material is called zinc sulfide, so you could use that to do a little bit of research. Uh, th there's an absorption and re-emission of energy, so just discuss that a little bit, this absorption and re-emission of energy. Okay, so I want you to discuss that, what's happening. You can refer to as well 
photons in this context. Okay, so you get the photons, remember those are little packets of electromagnetic energy. Uh, gamma radiation, that's elect electromagnetic. Light is also electromagnetic, so you want to link those together as well. Talk about the numbers of the photons that you get. Okay, so obviously you can appreciate you're starting off with gamma photons and then getting out visible light photons. So just discuss the number uh, of each of those photons. Not, I'm not asking you to give me numbers, but a comparison. Which one has the most? Are there more gamma photons or more visible light photons after, uh, before and after the scintillation occurs? So that's the scintillator. Next, we're on to the photomultiplier tube. Now, the photomultiplier tube is actually a combination of two components. So I want you to refer to those two components and ge generally explain, or briefly explain, what each one does. So within here, you actually have a photo, photo cathode and dynodes. So the photocathode, uh, what you have happening here is the visible light which comes out of the scintillator knocks electrons out of the photocathode material. So you get electrons knocked out, and then what you do is you have electric fields which accelerate those electrons along the photomultiplier tube. And the dynodes, you have these plates, and the electrons are accelerated into those plates and when the electrons strike the plates, they knock more electrons out. And so those electrons, you've got more coming out of each stage of the dynodes. And you have several stages. And as you go along, the number of electrons you have increases at each stage. So at the end of it, what you've done is you've multiplied the number of electrons. So I want you to... Multiply the number of electrons. How, how do you think that works in terms of an, uh, the strength of your signal? Okay, so link that to strength of signal. Right, so you get that. You start off the visible light photons, they knock electrons out here, and then they're accelerated, and each time they strike a stage, get more electrons. So we're multiplying the number of electrons, relate that to the strength of the signal. Okay, like right, the beginning and the end of that. Then you have the electronics or computer stage. And what this stage does is it gathers information from the photomultiplier tubes and processes it turns it into an image which it displays on a monitor. So there is actually a, a fifth stage, but it's not crucial to the working of the gamma camera. Uh, so we process the information from the photomultiplier tube. It's put on the monitor so that the radiologist can interpret what's happening inside the body from the monitor. And that is our fourth and final stage. That's all that is required for P3 and P4. So just to remind you again, with P4, what we were doing is explaining what's happening in, t in this stage here, the detection of the radio pharmaceutical, explaining it in terms of the key components there. 